Good morning. Um, thank you for joining um, myself and my colleague Elena for another one of our webinar series this morning. And we will be looking today at the vital role of the labour market data for the UK's government economic plans. There's been lots of announcements in the last couple of weeks that are very exciting and lots of conversations to talk about. So I'm absolutely delighted to be chatting through this. And within the chat function, our, our colleague will be sharing a link to a blog that we've done um, around this as well, for you, if, if you want to look at that in a bit more detail. Um, I, I'm Ben Owen, I'm the Vice President for Global Client Success. And as always, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Elena. Good, mo good morning, Elena. Hello, Ben. So re really excited to, to be joined by Elena. And um, if you've not seen, there'll be a prompt later on, but Elena's done a fantastic piece of research um, around AI, which is well, definitely worth a read. Um, so in terms of today's agenda, um, we'll just go through a little recap about us as a company, about Lightcast, what we do. Um, then we're going to start to work through the role of data in unlocking the government's mission. Um, there's been lots of talk about skills. Um, I've seen a, a, an announcement this week from the Minister of Skills, Dame Jackie Smith, around how vital skills are for unlocking opportunities. So we'll be talking about that. And then we'll be looking at three really key areas um, that governments announced through the manifesto and election process and, and has come out before the summer recess, um, which was local growth, the skills strategy, and then and then we're going to look at um, career pathways and how some di exciting new data taxonomies that we've we've launched in the UK in the last few months um, are offering really good insight around that. They'll then be concluding um, remarks and just a, re a reminder about what else is coming up um, from us as a company. So about Lightcast, who are we? What is our mission? Well, our mission is to unlock new possibilities in the labour market. And we do that um, through our education and government uh, business units that myself and Elena work in. And then we also do that through our um, employer um, and talent business unit that we also um, um, support colleagues in that as well. So really, from, from today's perspective, we're going to be looking at how education providers need to use our data to connect to what's happening in the local labour market, how communities and local government and MCAs and central government can create um, effective programmes for economic prosperity. And then the most important bit of, bit of that in the last couple of years from an LSIT perspective has been the employer voice. And so how employers better understand what's happening in their workforce and identify what that future skills demand um, may look like. And then just around our data, so we have a combination of structural LMI, so they're um, statistics that, that we, we receive from, from various governments um, in, in the countries that we operate. We have job posting data where we capture ourselves and, and we capture a, a high volume of job posting um, adverts every single day. We've also got professional um, profile data that we capture as a result of that as well. Um, we have software, so, so um, you know people might be familiar with our um, analyst platform and our career coach platforms and our various other platforms that we have available. API and Snowflake, and we're actually seeing lots, lots more customers, particularly in the UK education and government space, starting to migrate into data feeds, um, particularly around the integration with Power BI, which is an exciting development. And then within Elena's wheelhouse, we have applied research, and so we also do consultancy and research work. So that's a little bit about us um, and, and our data. Um, the first thing really that I wanted, we wanted to talk through is really look at how we operate um, in, in the UK and who are the key drivers really in, 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 in some of these policy pieces around the government. And so government are policymakers, some of our clients um, and the Ministry of Justice. So we do a lot of work with His Majesty's Prison and Probation Service. There's some really good examples at the minute how they're working with the likes of City and Guilds, um, one of the big awarding org organisations, to develop some trial provision around rail industries and rail track provision. So we get people out of incarceration through probation and then ultimately into, into well-paid and well-valued jobs in our infrastructure projects. We work with government departments like the Migratory Advisory Council and have done over a number of years. And in terms of policy, in terms of awarding organisations or professional bodies, we also work with the likes of SimSpar in the sport world. And SimSpar have been instrumental, really, in kind of looking at what the future of, of that sector needs to look like. In terms of training providers, we have about 100 colleges and independent training providers that work with us 
across the United Kingdom every single day. We're doing lots of interesting things with those training providers. And we have about 30 universities that we work with as well. And then in terms of what we do in the community and government space, well, we've been involved in LSIT research. We've been involved in supporting the MCAs as devolution has rolled out in the previous government, continues to be a big priority in, in this current government, local government, and then chambers of commerce. And we work with around 50 local governments, um, chambers of commerce, economic development um, agencies, a few LEPs still kicking about, lots of lots of familiar acronyms there. Um, and most um, mayoral combined authorities and the new de devolved deals, they tend to be our customers as well. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a broad insight into what we're doing and who we're working with um, in, in the United Kingdom. And then the first thing we really wanted to talk about was obviously today's topic. What is the new plan, the, the government's new plan for labour market data, don't we, Elena? We want to go through kind of where, where we can really help um, unlock a couple of those things, I think, which is kickstart economic growth is the first one. Definitely think we can do a lot there around um, understanding what's happening um, in a local economy. Um, you know, as we're starting to work with those uh, MCAs, um, those LSIP boards, also working with, with with the skills providers, we're starting to understand what what needs to be true in terms of economic growth, um, particularly around. Um, what we're seeing, obviously, some of the harder to recruit sectors, the health sector, the hospitality sector. And so we can really help to unlock those insights and really understand what's happening from a, an economic growth perspective. Um, and then the other the other side of that is to break down those um, barriers to opportunity as well. So where are those hard to reach jobs? Where is that growth um, potential um, for that region? And, and how do how do we start to bring employers, education, local government, central government, policymakers and funders in, in, into that uh, singular conversation about what, what, what needs to happen in that area. Anything from you on that one, Elena? I think that's a nice introduction, Ben, and I, I completely agree with you. Those are two key areas where uh, data and our work can help. The, the, the thing as always with a new government uh, coming, uh, coming in, there's a bit of post-election period where the dust is settling and everyone is trying to uh, uh, understand and align on the new priorities. One of the good things that we are seeing there is that the government is keen on taking a data evidence-led approach to uh, policy making. And in that sense, uh, if we think about our labor market data, uh, campaign space, there are quite a few places, as the one you mentioned, where actually having a good solid evidence base can be critical in determining the direction of how policies shape. I mean, if we think about kickstarting economic growth, um, that's quite a big task, and it's not something that's new to the to the efforts of different governments that have been in place. And so really understanding what are the drivers of economic growth, what are the differences between different places, and what do they mean in practice, uh, can really make a big opportunity in terms of um, seeing growth uh, up and down the country, but also ensuring that uh, uh, people all over the country of all different backgrounds can access these opportunities, which kind of links on uh, with mission four that you also mentioned. Mm, absolutely. And I think it's a, a fascinating, yeah, if only it would be so easy to just kickstart economic growth. But I think, uh, and what we've seen this week is an announcement that obviously the UK economy has been relatively stagnant in the last couple of months. Um, I think what's what fascinates me, and, and, and we'll get into this in a bit more detail, is, is the opportunity to kind of look through devolution. And one of the uh, the government policies that, 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 that the current government have proposed is around how that levy is kind of changed and particularly looking at, at the adult market, because there's a vast majority of people in work currently that would like to progress, would like to, to get into higher paid, higher value jobs. And sometimes... Um, the lack of, of, of skills or transferable skills or knowledge is, is kind of limiting them. So I'm quite excited um, to really kind of go through where those opportunities are today as well. So if we just hand over to what the, what the policy landscape does look like, um, what we know so far, like Elena said, it was a, a, a late election in, in terms of summer and, 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 and ultimately we've had a bit of a summer break and the, and the dust is still settling. 
there's lots and lots of moving parts. What we, we've known so far from, from manifestos and, and through commitments in the last few weeks is obviously Skills England um, is kind of carrying on and, and that will start to subsume some more traditional um, parts of what, what was the DfE. Um, the, you know, the government has been really clear they want to declutter um, the skill system within England and Wales. So that'll be interesting to see how that kind of rolls out. And, and this week, we've had an announcement that the ESFA is being subsumed into back into the Department of, 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 of Education. So that's an interesting one around, you know, the, the funder and regulator for a lot of schools and, and colleges and training providers will be subsumed back into the DfE. So there's some interesting um, um, debates to be had around that. Also, IFA, who, who we've done a lot of work with, uh, um, um, they, they will be part of Skills England. And again, interesting to see how we carry on that conversation around skills-based competencies, live skills data finding its way into qualification design, such as standards um, and, and T-levels. Localism agenda, um, you know, so, so devolution, levelling up's kind of been replaced a little bit with the localism agenda, but it's very clear, you know, with 10 metro mayors, that there's going to be a lot of um, lot of local sway around kind of what that skills demand is. And as we know, LSIPs are reasonably mature now, um, but obviously we'll start to see uh, probably an evolution of that as more of those metro mayors start to understand what October's budget looks like, what 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 they really want to kind of deliver in terms of their, their own um, local agenda. Um, the ongoing technical quali- qualification revo- reform and review. So as we know, this year... Um, T levels, um, the, the 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 defunding of, of kind of technical qualifications has been um, paused for this year. But what does that mean for future generations? What does that mean in terms of technical education? Again, what's that employer voice? What's that regional need? What will that look like for colleges? I suppose some some certainty around that will probably come once the review um, that, that's currently happening will, will will be concluded probably in the new year. But there's a lot of uncertainty still around what that 16 to 19 technical space um, could and should look like. Um, and then I mentioned it a second ago, but obviously the, the, the levy reform was in the manifesto. Not seen a lot about that, but that would open up, I think, opportunities for more collaboration between universities, training providers, colleges in that kind of shorter, higher um, skilled technical skills space. So, so a very interesting, um, very interesting set of policy landscape so far and, and, and all of those as Elena said require some some evidence require data-led decisions and ultimately that's where we, we definitely can come in and assist in that thinking at, at every single level whether that be local level or, or central level and, and within education as well so what does it really mean in practice so I'll hand over to you um, Elena for this slide yes so what does it mean in practice as you're saying uh, what what where can we provide evidence? What kind of evidence is needed? If we look at uh, the kind of conversation the government has had so far, where the dust may be settling and everything, there are two particular areas where data is key and where there is particular appetite from the government at the moment. One is uh, definitely around local growth, which combines a kind of the mission around unlocking economic growth and also the localism agenda that you were just uh, alluding to uh, in the previous slide, Ben. And so that is about how to increase local collaboration, understanding the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities that there are in a local economy and leveraging them to ensure that uh, um, places can grow and people in those places can thrive. And that links to the second point, which is around the skill strategy. Uh, one of the key things the government is currently looking into, uh, not just with the creation of Skills England, but also more in general, they want to make clarity uh, around uh, the skill strategy, both at the national level, but also at the local level. And again, this requires a data-driven approach to try to understand identify and understand the scale of the challenge, the type of challenge the different places are facing, um, the type of opportunities that are there. Um, different people may have, they have a different skill set, but also requires a common language. Um, skills is a very complicated landscape, part of the reason why they want to simplify it. And this requires everyone in the space to talk the same language. And then The third point where data can be critical uh, is around unlocking new career pathways. 
So if we are creating and promoting local economic growth, so we have identified skill strategies that can help people upskill and retrain. What are they being upskilled to? What are they retraining for? They need, there needs to be clear career pathways that can help people to get into better paid job in higher quality jobs. And so again, data can help us understand what these pathways are so that it's not just a shot in the dark, but there is a clear plan uh, that can be put in place uh, to ensure effective uh, policy making as well. And so the, the goal here, and I think that's what we're going to deep dive into in a moment, is in each of these uh, three areas, uh, we're going to do a bit of um, back and forth, Ben and I. Uh, I'll, I'll start doing the nerdy part, let's say, just I'll look at it from a, <laughs> how I would approach it from a data per perspective, what kind of, what's my thinking around uh, how I would approach some of these questions. And then we're also looking at how some of the customers that we work with have gone about this and some of the implication for policy making. So if I move to the next, oops, sorry. I think, um, okay, so uh, on uh, unlocking local growth, so what does it mean and what kind of things needs to be considered here? One of the things that the government um, has talked about, or actually the Labour Party has talked about a lot during the election and the campaign period, was around economic clusters and the importance of uh, building on local advantages and identifying the clusters that can help unlock economic growth. This is easier said than done because uh, uh, every place has its own uh, specificity. Uh, this does not mean that every place has a unique economic cluster that's unique to them and that we don't see in other parts of the country. At the end of the day, the, the UK economy is not that different from one place to another, but each place is unique in terms of the type of challenges they are, in terms of the type of advancement of development of policies, uh, in terms of availability of skills. So understanding all of these things is quite key in terms of unlocking uh, local economic growth. Uh, one of the tools that we use a lot when we try to answer questions in this space is what we call a strength finder, which is kind of what it looks like here on this graph. Basically, we try to bring together two different measures. First, one measure around trying to understand what's the economic composition of a different place. So if I think of a place, in this case, we put the example of the Leeds city region. Uh, the first thing that we want to know is what kind of industries do we see in this place right now? And uh, what is the distribution of the industries in this place compared to the national average? Does Leeds have more of something compared to the national average, in which case it's a cluster for that area? Or does a specific sector not really play a key role in the area. So that's the first uh, component that we look at, and that's what you see on the x-axis of this picture, which we call employment concentration. And then uh, the other component that we looked at is uh, how, how are these sectors growing in the national economy? And the rationale behind this is, uh, are the sectors that are really present in an area growing or declining nationally? Because that matters in terms of what understanding whether they are a strength for a place or a risk uh, for a place. Um, and what we do is basically we can map all the different industries, all the different economic clusters that are available in a, in a given economy um, against these two metrics and uh, we can identify whether different industries are a strength for that place, which means that there is already a high concentration in that place and that sector is growing a lot nationally, which probably gives a good indication of a sector that is worth continuing investing on to unlock economic growth. Uh, we can identify sectors of opportunities, which are sectors that are growing a lot at the national level, but perhaps are not very much concentrated in an area. So if the area invested more into attracting these kind of jobs, there's a good chance that it would unlock economic growth over the longer term because it's a faster growing sector at the national level, as well as identifying risks. And with risks, in this case, we think about sectors that are highly concentrated 
locally, but they're not really growing at the national level. So these are sectors that are shrinking in the UK economy and uh, where a uh, local economy has a particular large number of jobs in these uh, uh, sectors. Uh, it's likely that it's facing some quite quite significant challenges going forward in terms of unlocking economic development. So what we can do, and this is the example that we've done here for Lead City Region, is we can map different clusters against these four categories and trying to understand what are the areas of strength and opportunities uh, for a given area. And that already gives a really good starting place in terms of understanding what are the strategies to put in place. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Thank go you. for and we'll just talk about another example. So, so Leeds City Region is a great example. Um, another good example, one of our um, um, bigger clients is, is GLA. And obviously, they were great London Authority, one of the first devolved pilot areas. And so that we've done um, a tremendous amount. Our colleague um, um, supports those. And, and what in particular, what GLA have been doing is sharing job postings with their stakeholders on a quarterly basis to be explored in a very public facing website so they've been able to kind of share that information for their internal key, um, stakeholders and external stakeholders they've also done um, quite similar analysis to, to what we've just looked at um, but to better understand the presence of green jobs and green skills in London so they've used our data for a lot of research to look at as we know net zero green was a priority in the last government priority of this government and so they've done a lot of work around that as well um, so, so there's some really exciting things that's happening um, within GLA. And, and, and again, we're more than happy to kind of share the link to the website. But, but they're definitely doing some very interesting things around sharing that skills data. And, and like Elena said earlier on, really talk, trying to talk that common language of skills um, between education, employers and, and those other key stakeholders. And so very exciting um, work that's happening there in GLA. Just going to move on now to um, skills. So, so the second thing, I'll hand over to you, Elena. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this one builds uh, quite nicely to uh, on what you were saying and what we were just chatting about, Ben, because uh, a first step, you need to understand what you got in your area, what kind of are the areas of strengths, uh, what are the industries worth investing on, uh, what are your threats. Uh, now, the, the second question that comes after that is, OK, I've got this sector that I'm really good at. What do this sector needs? What kind of skills do they require in order to continue to grow and thrive in the future? And that's where data, again, can help in terms of outlining skill strategies, both at the national level and at the local level. So trying to understand um, what uh, employers need, what the businesses need in terms of skills is key because it helps shape um, a skill strategy, a training and education provision that is aligned with the um, with the, the business needs. And I mean, and Ben and I can talk about this forever. And we've done a previous web webinar on this as well. Um, businesses don't necessarily talk the same language that uh, uh, training providers and education providers in general do. They don't necessarily, I dare say, care about uh, qualifications as much. They are particularly focused on understanding and um, attracting talent with specific skill sets. So being able to map the type of skills, uh, skill sets that are required in different industries, especially industries that uh, um, are growing in a local area, can plays uh, can play a big important role in uh, shaping an effective local strategy but also a national strategy and again following the example before so we were looking at the Leeds city region uh, we saw that one of the clusters of strength for Leeds is definitely a around the financial services sector. And so then the question is, what are the kind of skills that are being required in the sector? And one of the things that we can do with our job postings data is actually go directly through the, to the source, go through thousands and thousands and thousands of job postings directly from employers and see what are the specific skills that they mention uh, in relation to this particular sector or to specific occupation. So this is the first bit, and then I'll move on to the next slide to show you a second thing. 
The second thing goes back to the point that I was just mentioning now, which is employers are less concerned about qualifications and more about skills. If we are to build a successful skill strategy, we need all the stakeholders to speak the same language. A skill strategy is not just something that uh, uh, training providers do on their own or the national government does on its own. Uh, There's a lot of players involved, both nationally and locally. There are multiple government departments involved, all the different uh, local players, the education providers, the businesses, MCAs, labs, LC. There's lots of stakeholders that need to align. And in order for this to succeed, for skill strategy to be successful, all the players need to speak the same language. And in this sense, being able to speak the language of skills helps in so many ways because it helps employers translate their needs in something that is really practical, but also um, very actionable because skills are like tokens. They're very specific about the things that employers need. It it also helps uh, education providers because it gives a very clear steer in terms of what um, they need to teach in order to align with the local labor market. And so in that space, one of the things that we have spent a lot of time and work and resources on is on the development of an open skills taxonomy, uh, which tries to capture all the skills that are mentioned by uh, businesses in the labor market. These skills are categorized in uh, 32 macro areas, uh, so the likes of uh, IT, health, construction. And then within each of these areas, you can find that you can drill down to the very specific skills, knowledge and abilities that are being required in the labor market. And then we also classify them in three macro categories around whether these are skills that are transversal, so they are skills that can be found in all many industries, or specialized, which means they're very specific and technical on a specific sector, segment of the labor market occupation, as well as digital skills and software, which are rising in demand at the moment and again are very specific. And the hope with this taxonomy, which I mean, we will share the slides at the end of the presentation. There's a link on the slides. You can uh, use it and it helps bridge the gap between the different stakeholders. Thank you, Elena. And I think, yeah, skills is definitely going to be the one thing that we really talk a lot about. And, and I agree, we could talk about that for, a, for, for, for for many an hour. But I do, I do think this is a critical one for me. And certainly when we speak to our educational clients and, and obviously our, our, our central government and local government clients, it's understanding how we start to fund the skills piece rather than the qualification piece per se as it is. Because if we look at, if we just look at job adverts alone in, in the UK, about seven sort of seven million job adverts so far this year. About seventy five percent of those don't actually specify qualification demand across all sectors, and so this is definitely something that I think is a really critical thing. In order for a lot of those government strategies to be successful, is everyone kind of getting around that table? And we'll talk about collaboration um, um, in a few slides time. But I do think it's that understanding of it's not always a big, long qualification. If you're jumping from one career to another, sometimes you've got a tremendous amount of skills and capabilities in the jobs that you've done previously. It's a case of simply top, topping up. And this is where I think the, the open taxonomy really, really kind of comes to, comes to life. In terms of that skills strategy space from a customer perspective, we, we've been really heavily involved. You know, at the outset, I mentioned the fact that we work with a lot of colleges, training providers, local authorities, chambers, LEPs, when LEPs were, well, there is still some LEPs about, but LSIPs and MCAs and MCCAs and all the new acronyms that we we get to learn um, as things evolve. And what we've really done around that is is provided a lot of research around around the LSIP agenda from a a bespoke um, perspective. So so Elena and and, and colleagues, for example, one we did in, in kind of Nottingham, um, that a couple of the colleges commissioned around kind of digital demand and future digital demand, construction, our data features in a lot of the um, 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 work that was that was happened. So if you look in D2N2's skills plan, if you look at Greater Lincolnshire skills plan, um, the Federation of Small Businesses did, there's reference to our data in there. And so we've really played a key role in in, in the data that Elena's just, just really eloquently talked about. We played a really key role 
in kind of understanding what's happening and, and, and obviously working with not just the stakeholders, but, you know, attending employer forums, etc. cetera. Um, the other thing that we've done, and I mentioned it earlier on, but we have, we have done quite a bit of work with IFA. I know there's a, a lot of change happening within that Skills England pot, but we were doing quite a lot of work with IFA around kind of up-to-date skills development and how that kind of fits into their trailblazer development groups and how that fits into future standard or possible T-level development. You know, we're very optimistic. We'll, we'll, we'll carry on doing that. I'm very, very eager to carry on doing that with, with the DfE and, and Skills England. But I think the interesting thing, and I've spoken at a few conferences this year, is, is that kind of willingness to look at that skills piece um, rather than just the, the kind of flat, flat qualification. So I think this is a quite an exciting um, juncture, I think. And, and certainly everything we hear from every minister so far is all about skills and skills are going to unlock future growth. Skills are going to unlock growth for those at, at the kind of low salary um, 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 jobs as well. It's going to unlock that opportunity. So I think this is a really... Um, fascinating subject, like I said, that we could speak for for, for, for for many many an hour. But we'll move on to to career pathways, which is um, um, so. This was a, a taxonomy developed and launched in the US last year, and then it's come to the UK um, this year in May this year, and available to UK customers through our analyst platform. So I'll just hand over to you, Elena, for this slide. Yeah, and I think Ben, what you were saying just there about the importance of uh, qualific uh, of skills versus qualifications, uh, actually, is a very nice link to this one in the sense that uh, um, the next once you've identified the um, the six the key sectors that you want in, to invest in in your area, you understand the skills uh, that are needed for that sector to thrive. Then the next step is getting workers to have these skills, identifying the career pathways that can bring workers from place A to place B in terms of their career and in terms of helping the growth of a local economy. And uh, in, in that sense, what you were saying, and I know you'll talk about this more in the, uh, also going forward, is not that everyone is uh, still 16. Well, we, we certainly are at 16 and just about to enter the labor market ourselves. But the point being is that a lot of the people that need this transition, these career pathways, are actually people that are already in work. So being able to understand the connection between one job and the other is also quite important to help transition workers that are already in the workforce and not they are just coming out of the education system. And so what you see, what you see here uh, as, as this image, uh, we are continuing with the lead city region, financial services, we're thinking about financial analyst. So this is somebody that works in the financial analyst, as a financial analyst in uh, Leeds. What kind of opportunities are available in this region for him or her as they go forward in their career? And uh, um, the way we've done this is by mapping the skill similarities of different occupations. So we took the skills profile of all the job postings for financial analysts and we compared that with all the other occupations that are available in the lead city region. And we try to identify the specific occupations that have the most similar, most relevant uh, profile. And you can see a few here uh, on the slides, like for example, data manager, data specialist, uh, research analyst, also uh, analytical roles in other sectors. So these are all the opportunities that could potentially be opened up for an individual that is currently working in this sector that would want to continue and push different opportunities, perhaps higher paying jobs, perhaps looking for better quality of work. Uh, this tool helps create these pathways. It's also very helpful in the education context, don't get me wrong. Um, it's also quite helpful in terms of helping uh, people that are currently in the education system understand what are the opportunities that are available uh, beyond training for a, specific, uh, for a specific qualification linked to any of these specific roles. And it's also a very useful tool uh, for businesses in a sort of reverse engineer uh, engineering way, in the sense that um, a lot of the time, companies are looking for um, recruiting uh, for a specific role. And that role in a local area may, may be missing 
for many reasons. It could be that there just aren't many people with that specific profile in that area. It may be that the demand is quite high and there's a lot of companies competing for uh, the same number of people. And so in that sense, uh, having a clear idea of how different occupations link to one another can actually help uh, um, businesses broaden the talent pool that they can draw talent from uh, and, and, and so uh, create opportunities that weren't there before. So th there's lots of applications there. And again, this is based on the uh, common language skills, uh, being able to understand the similarities and differences between different uh, jobs. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, it's a fascinating tool and, and certainly one I was uh, with a client um, the other day <clears throat> and certainly one where we're starting to think about within that education space, like, so how can this be translated into what provision looks like? Um, particularly, like, say, around the fact that depending on which research you read, roughly about 75 to 80 percent of the 2030 workforce are in work now. And I think that's the one thing as we come towards the end of this session and we think about conclusions and recommendations is that we would definitely love to see a bit more focus around the adult market, the adult space. There's a lot of work done or being done around kind of 16 to 19 provision, which Elena, you know, rightly, you know, that, that is the future of our workforce, but what is the, the, the here and now of our workforce? You know, 16 year olds not going to fill the, the challenge that we've got in the care sector or the hospitality sector or some aspects of the retail sector and construction, et cetera. So, I think this is a really interesting one in that it focus on that skills and competencies and where we're really seeing um, some, some positive work. And, and it is early days. Like I said, we only launched it in, in, in May and, and the summer recess sometimes hits some of our client base. But really trading providers are, are using this and they see a real value in working through how this can help an employer to unlock where that apprentice goes next. So once that apprentice within that employer has completed their apprenticeship, where does their career progress to? And, and like like you, 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 you rightly pointed out, Lena, this is also very useful in our, in our kind of talent and employer-led business in that helping employers to really understand what skills they've got. If you're a big multinational employer, you've got lots of job descriptions and lots of jobs in there, but what skills have you currently got? And ultimately, what skills do you need? And, and that's what... Um, training providers are really seeing this as a big opportunity is, is to a lead potential skills boot camp provision moving forward um, and, and and highlight where people can can, can kind of progress into roles um, but also particularly around that apprentices uh, apprentice career advice employer advice around so so your apprentice has completed the standard what's the next standard where do they move to what are the opportunities so i think Really great, really great tool, really exciting. I think we've only really started to scratch the surface of how this can help a lot of these government priorities and particularly, like, say, around that that retraining, that reskilling, you know, for those jobs that may be at risk of automation or AI, you know, where, what skills do those people got? Where do they move to next? Um, and, and ultimately how, you know, we can fund some of that. So, again, that's where the role of the Department of Education Skills England comes in is, how do we work with with, with, with awarding bodies and, and providers on that? And so bringing it all together, really, I think I'll, I'll kind of focus on the, the partnership one first, if that's okay, um, Elena, and then um, um, and we can talk about the data side of it. But but I really think we, we saw this through devolution. We saw this in the previous government. We, we definitely see this will, will be a really big thing through localism is that collaboration, you know, between universities, colleges, training providers, local authorities, mayoral combined authorities, and how they interact with central government around where, you know, where things haven't always been right. You know, one of the things we saw through the, the pilot of devolution and one of the recommendations was about the deregulation of adult funding. Now, that didn't happen. Um, I, I don't think we were set up to maybe embrace that at the time. But certainly, you know, thinking back to, to Elena's previous slide around career pathways, if we want to migrate people from job A to B, you know, as, as green jobs evolve and, and traditional jobs kind of, you know, a, a, a decreased, then we, we need to have shorter, sharper qualifications, a very kind of agile qualification funding system to be able to get those people from job A from to, to, to job B. And particularly as, like I said, people are starting to transition as jobs become more and more automated, AI takes more and more of a, a kind of an impact in that job market 
Um, we all really need to speak the same language. It's not that in no way, shape or form, I don't want anyone to go away thinking that me and Elena don't value qualifications. We absolutely do. And to an extent, employers do. The challenge is there's still 70 odd thousand vocational qualifications in the learning name database. There's tens of thousands of degrees. There's 720 odd, I think, or 30 odd standards, 127 standards in engineering alone. It's too much in that space for employers to really understand. And so that common language of skills, I think, is becoming absolutely critical. And we see more universities, we see more local authorities, MCAs, colleges starting to think about how curriculum is skillified. How do we start to coach people to talk that language of skills as they're migrating out of college and into work? And certainly that pilot I mentioned earlier on with, with HMPPS and City and Guilds in the rail sector, that is very skills focused, skills and competency focused. So I definitely think, you know, the future is very bright. It's hard work. You know, it's easy for us to sit here and say, this is what we think should happen. There's going to be a lot of hard work. And we know that October's budget will be very challenging. But I do think there's a lot of opportunity to really start to crack what that national skills infrastructure needs to look like. And decluttering it, which is what's happening at the minute, is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, I'll hand over to you, Elena, for, for, for the data side of it, if that's okay. No, I, I love the way you, you finished off there, Ben, because yes, the future is brighter. And actually, one thing that we do have, and it fits very nicely with the fact that I'm talking about data, but unlike 10 years ago or 20 years ago, there's plenty of data that we can use today to actually better understand these issues. So we are in an incredibly lucky position because we have much more than we can use to try and understand these problems and find solutions that are actually evidence-led. So this the future is brighter. I completely uh, agree with you, Ben, on that. And then touching on, on to the last point, the local stakeholders one. I mean, one thing that I was thinking while you were talking about career pathways, it's once again, different places are in very different uh, position when it comes to uh, unlocking uh, economic growth and opportunities. Some parts of the countries, the challenge is actually creating good jobs. In other parts of the country, the challenge is getting people to do the jobs that are there because uh, there's so many jobs and not enough people because there are so many jobs, but not the people with the right qualifications. So being able to, yes, have an overarching national strategy, but also being able to uh, tailor the different uh, requirements uh, to the requirements of different local economies is essential. And in that space, uh, the voice of local stakeholders is key, is key and uh, can play a super important role, uh, as well as, again, being backed by data and having that local understanding, not just the national picture, can help uh, uh, leverage uh, uh, leverage the decision making process. So yes, the conclusion for me is very similar to yours. Ben, the future is brighter, and I'm actually very excited to see how the next few months will pan out uh, uh, in terms of the policy space. Absolutely, and I think yeah, like to, to, to echo that. I mean, the fact that we. We work with so many of those stakeholders that are part of this solution. We've got so much rich data um, around that job trend. And, and absolutely, I think that's a really key, that final point that you've, you've finished on there is, is absolutely critical. Is national is national, but also regional is super, super important as well. So thank, thank you, um, Elena, for your insights. And we'll just kind of finish off there by um, reminding you actually around our, our skills outlook. So my colleague Elena and, and others re really led on on a great piece of work around how um, AI is kind of changing the world of work, but also the way, um, 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 or, or not necessarily, should I say, the way that we perhaps imagined. Um, so it's a fascinating read. The link there um, in, in that slide is, is well worth having a look. And I think it's, it's fascinating for me around, we still expect certain jobs to kind of change, but, but not necessarily in how we expected them to change, which I think, um, is great. So I'll just kind of conclude there. Um, thank you for, for, for joining in this morning um, um, and, and listening to myself and Elena. Um, brilliant insights as always for you, Elena. Thank you very much. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all um, in, in the next one. So thank you ever so much. Have a good day.